Uh, this morning what we're going to do is each, uh, Don and I and Bill are going to uh, talk for about 10 or 15 minutes or less and just kind of tell our story in, a, in an abbreviated way. Uh, most of you have heard mine, but some of you haven't heard uh, Bill. We just thought we'd put it in context so you know who's talking to you, and then Bill's going to expand a little bit about the etymology of the sixth and the seventh step and give us a little background in history. Uh, there's an old uh, Chinese proverb about those who know don't say and those who say don't know. And uh, so you have three people who are here this morning to tell you about the sixth and the seventh step. So uh, take that and take take that as you will. This is uh, it's a pretty big. It's a pretty big topic and certainly one of the cores, I, I think, of the program. So it's inexhaustive. Uh, and uh, whatever I talk about in, in, in that line, I'll, I'll, it's in that context. You know, I feel like I'm a, you know, a imperfect practitioner of a very of a demanding aspect of our program. But I think, you know, it's really exciting to see as many people as we have here in the room. When I came in Alcoholics Anonymous, when you went to a conference and you heard talks, most of the talks on recovery were started with the first drink and ended with the last drink. And uh, clearly you saw that a miracle happened in the man or woman's life who gave you the story, and you can clearly see that they were different, but you never, you didn't always hear the details of how that difference happened. And you got, kind of got the impression that you came into AA and life got okay. Well, many of us have come into Alcoholics Anonymous you know, pretty young and started their lives and we've gotten sober and after two or three or four years, uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. You know, still a lot of issues at hand and still some, you know, a large level of residual unmanageability that we might have thought, you know, would have been handled just by entrance into Alcoholics Anonymous and trying to practice these principles in all our affairs. Uh, not an easy deal, living life, you know, and uh, putting the principles in action is a, is a pretty big deal. So more and more, the, I think the talks in Alcoholics Anonymous have evolved. You know, they evolved where people talked about the steps, and uh, I think Chuck Chamberlain was one of the first people who shared, you know, started to share specifically on spirituality. And now I think we're starting to hear more people talk about issues in recovery and the application of the principles, you know, of our steps, not just as it relates to, you know, stopping drinking and, and the initiation of our recovery, but to the kind of continuation and trying to really find in our quality of our lives uh, the balance that we that certainly escaped us prior to coming here. I started to drink when I was 14 years old. I was kind of an insecure small kid. I was one of seven kids. Uh, when I entered high school, I was under five feet. I weighed 95 pounds. I, you know, was always trying to compensate for that. You know, had a big mouth. Was always trying to attract attention. Uh, was in trouble. I. I, I after having two children that are attention deficit, I think pretty good diagnosis that I was attention. I got thrown out of grade school about 40 times. I had my desk in the principal's office for two or three months, you know, just kind of constantly in trouble. And I always felt like, you know, didn't feel like I was a bad guy, just couldn't keep my mouth shut, was kind of bugsy, antsy, high energy level. I kind of vibrated. Joe was at my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's always kind of hard to to talk in front of your teachers, you know, and Joe was one of my teachers. Uh, when I got to high school, uh, you know, wanted things to be different. It was like a new start. Got to be a marginal member of the in-group. I felt like everybody else got to school a half hour early and held a meeting to decide what was going to go on for the day, and, <laughs> and I missed the meeting. I didn't have an invitation to it. Kept trying to find out throughout the day what they talked about, you know, and. Uh, because it seemed like everybody else knew. You looked at them, you know, and now we know we're looking at their outsides and we're looking at our own insides and the insecurities. Uh, but somewhere in my uh, freshman year, uh, Buddy and I went out and we split a fifth of whiskey and my life changed. Uh, I went to a military school on a college campus. We drank in high school like most people drink in colleges. You know, we had fraternities and a few of us almost died of alcohol poisoning. We just drank our brains out. I never... I didn't know that we drank more than anybody else because, of, you know, most people. Of my high school class of 120, there are 12 members of Alcoholics Anonymous that I that I know of. So, of my five closest friends, four are in AA and one's in Al-Anon. So there was a lot of 
alcoholism, but there was a lot of recovering. So, but the trouble we got into it seemed, you know, it seemed like there was no legitimate way to drink. You know, if you got caught when you were 15 years old, you know, you got into a heck of a lot of trouble with your father, a heck of a lot of trouble with the police, or there was no legitimate way to drink or use. And so I thought the trouble I got into was due to that fact rather than the way I was drinking. I thought I had bad luck, got caught more often, car accidents, couple of arrests, <clears throat> false ID cards, that kind of thing. I used to make false ID cards. I had a talent for drafting. <laughs> and, uh, Federal government kind of it was okay with drivers, like the federal government kind of frowned on it with draft cards, though. So that was. Uh, uh, so I had a chance to go away to college, and I thought that there, you know, I'd be treated like an adult. You know, my drinking, I just kind of blend in. Only I uh, didn't blend in. I could not shut my drinking down. I don't know what it. You know, it was a very important part of my life. I just it was. The, I don't know why. I seem to have been born with my amplifier up around eight or nine. And uh, with that much noise in your head, it was difficult for me to hear the rest of the world and kind of relate to the rest of the world, such as it was. When I had three or four drinks in me, it was like my amplifier went down to two or three. I could move with a sense of ease that I had, you know, that I got almost no other way. And uh, to give that up was just too much for me, and I didn't even understand that. I thought everybody got the same benefit from drinking that I got. Uh, at school, I went to the University of Notre Dame, I was in civil engineering, started out as a pretty good student, and I just kind of went downhill, you know, by the time I got to my senior year, you know, I was going to school one day a week. It's kind of tough to bluff your way through a thermodynamics exam, you know, it, even for an alcoholic. And uh, one day I just walked out, and uh, I was due to be commissioned in the Army. I had to get a medical release, and the medical release I got was for alcoholism. I was diagnosed an alcoholic when I was 19. Uh, it seems like once or twice a year I always had kind of an episode where I totaled out a car, you know, almost got killed or kind of looked like I was uh, self-destructive. And uh, so I started seeing a psychiatrist fairly early in that process. My family was taking me around trying to get me healed at different places. And uh, I thought that psychiatrist was nuts diagnosing me as an alcoholic, but it got me out of the service. And uh, I came home, finished school at St. Thomas, and when I finished school, the family asked me to leave the house and uh, said, we love you and we care about you, but you're a pain in the ass. And, uh, you know, I left and worked at a liquor store for about six months, and then I got a job as a waiter at a private club for about six months. And my life that last year was just, you know, pretty tacky. Uh, there's a lot of spectacular stories I could tell you, but mostly alcoholism is just tacky. You know, I mean, it's... It really is. I mean, it's just treating the people in your life who you care about and love in a in a real substandard manner. It's that high cost of low living, you know, that we get uh, that we get used to, and it's it's kind of hard over a period of time to start to deny, you know, the you you seem to be the only constant factor in a whole series of failures and disgraces, you know. And, and uh, I was getting up in the morning, drinking a couple of beers, going to work. I'd work from ten to two as a waiter. From two to five, I'd go drink beer, and at five, I'd go buy a pint. I'd put it in my locker, and I'd drink it throughout the night, and then I'd figure out where I was going to stay for the evening. I think in the six months, I had an apartment that I shared with a guy in St. Paul, but I only made it home about 15 nights, I think, in those six months. I just kind of slept around with different people that I worked and lived with. You know, Dr. Seuss, that child author, those are actual photographs of people I lived with during that. <laughs> Uh, but I mean, I was clearly uh, had the confusion that most of us had. It seemed obvious to almost everybody on earth that I had a drinking problem, except to me, because I had had a couple of periods of sobriety just before I went back to my senior year at Notre Dame. I was rolled and robbed and pistol whipped and shot at and thrown out of the second story of a hotel and ended up in a hospital, and they were going to. I ended up in a psych ward, and they were going to keep me under observation and not let me go back to school. And I went back to school, and I was sober for three months. And everybody, I thought what people were telling me is, your problem is swallowing bourbon. Stop drinking, and you'll be okay. Well, I stopped drinking, and my life didn't all of a sudden boom. I didn't become the great kid or the model student or, you know. And I had a couple of periods where I 
didn't drink for extended periods of time, and they were frankly pretty damn uncomfortable, and I thought they proved to me that, number one, I could quit drinking if I wanted to, and number two, that drinking was, you know, not my problem, it was my answer. You know, cause got me in a little difficulty once in a while, but by and large, it worked as well and consistently as anything that I found, and I just could not see uh, with the level of pain, and I didn't even know, I, I really didn't, wasn't even able to, I, I think I thought I was in pursuit of pleasure, when in fact I was trying to numb the pain of, of, of being who I was. And uh, it just seemed impossible to me that just abstinence was going to solve the problem. So I was caught in a dilemma. I didn't, life didn't seem to be tolerable without drinking, and with drinking, my life was getting increasingly uh, more difficult. And uh, I lost that job as a waiter because I got beat up and got my face kicked in and came back home. The family took me back. I really made an attempt to put my life together. I think most of us that are familiar with alcoholism know a lot about starting over, uh, you know, Next semester, it's going to be different. If I get back after Christmas, I'm really going to study. You know, next job I get, I'm going to do it real different. I'm going to show up early and stay late. And, you know, I got a job. I got back together with Linda, who's my lovely wife today, a 31-year member of Al-Anon and me, lady. I've been a constant source of growth for Linda. <laughs> uh, I don't think she'd have half the program she has if it wasn't. <laughs> for my help, and uh, uh, I really wanted, I really tried to put the pieces in order that I, you know, kept trying to get it on track. It seemed like everybody else had directions, and I kept on trying to, you know, copy people, only I couldn't get it on track because I couldn't slow my drinking down enough, and now I'm the company drunk, and uh, uh, after six months, I'm in danger of being fired, so I quit. I get a sales job, and uh, I got the sales job, and after about six weeks, I go on a four-day drunk. I wake up one afternoon, and I panicked. Uh, I called AA. And two men, Bob K. and Warren W., came out and met me at the St. Clair Broiler in July of 1967. And that day, my life changed. Uh, there's something very special uh, about our tradition of sharing our experience, strength, and hope. Uh, and those men touched me in such a way, and with, with all the issues that I had had, with all the help that I had sought, I had never talked to another person with a drinking problem. There was something so very different about sitting down with another person, you know, saying, I'm from AA, I had a drinking problem, I found my answer, I don't know if you're going to find yours, we're here as much for ourselves as we are for you, we hope it helps you, but we know it helps us. And, uh, you know, if you have any interest, we'd be happy to take you to a meeting and help you. And they told me their drinking history, and uh, it just it altered my life, uh, that meeting. I drank twice after that, but from that moment on, I became active in Alcoholics Anonymous. And with the, uh, and I, I think just with, uh, uh, I was so, you know, AA was easy for me in, in many ways. I, don't, I was given the gift of liking AA from the moment I walked in. I worked with, uh, I was one of the youngest members of that uh, group for a hell of a long time. And whenever anybody young got, uh, kind of showed up, they often referred them to me. And so I worked with lots of younger people, as did Joe and Bev. And uh, almost no one I worked with for the first couple of years got sober. You know, a couple of, one woman who had uh, 18 treatments and, uh, that was the first 12-step call I went on. I don't work with women anymore. I don't wonder why. And uh, I didn't know that. That was I was, you know, six months sober. And and uh, uh, but I, it always just amazed me that people could have the level of difficulty they had in their lives, need Alcoholics Anonymous as much as anybody had ever seen, and wouldn't go. And they just didn't see the similarity. They just didn't like AA. And for me, it was like. From the moment I walked in AA, I, I had issues and problems, but one of the problems was not uh, thinking that I had found my answer in Alcoholics Anonymous. The problems and issues that I've had is, that, first of all, I'm kind of a complier. On the surface, I do just fine. You know, I'm, I'm a little bit of an idealist, a little bit of a philosopher, and you give me the principles and concepts, and I'm right in the game, and I'm, you know, studying them and reading them and throwing them back the way they are, but my first two trips I took out of town when I was in AA, I drank both those trips. 
big surprise to me. I didn't think, you know, if I look back on it, I had it planned. One was on my honeymoon and one was on a business trip. So it was clear to me that there was a lot of activity going on below the surface, you know, that either I wasn't willing to take a look at or didn't know about. And when I came into AA, I thought, you know, now that I'm sober, I mean, the problem was the reason my life's so crappy, the reason that, you know, I couldn't function and perform like the other people in my family and my friends was I was an alcoholic. And now I'm an Alcoholics Anonymous, and you, I've got the problem, you've got the answer. Hang on, baby, because finally all this potential that everybody's been talking to me about is finally going to actualize. And, uh, yeah. <coughs> uh, if there was any potential, it certainly didn't actualize, you know, at first. And what I think in many ways what we're going to be discussing here today is, is the fact of, and that many of us have is that you come in and you're kind of on a honeymoon for a period of time. It is a wonder. It is a revelation. I mean, we are dealing with transformation. It is about as profound an experience to have a level of addiction and problem that we had, full-blown disease of alcoholism, and to have a relief. I don't know. You know, I today think that's a process that's of God, and I think it's. Um, I don't know where you'd see that large a change and these large of numbers any place else it is uh, profound and I think when we talk about the new person being the lifeblood of AA the reason that's true is because the closer you are to that miracle when you can see it it's like looking in the eyes of an infant there is something so powerful about watching that change because you sometimes can't see it in yourself and the dailiness of your recovery sometimes grinds you down and you get back involved in you know the minutia the world and, and uh, but when you see someone else come in who's broken and hurt and uh, you all of a sudden see the light come back in their eyes and you see uh, I mean when people change internally they look different externally and, and there's a period of time where all of a sudden you can see Mary walk into the meeting and you know Mary's okay and, and it just is it's soothing to the to the soul to have that experience and we are blessed with the opportunity to have that on a regular basis. So uh, the rest of the morning, what, what you know, I'm going to be talking about, as I say, is, this, is my struggle and process. Uh, I came in with high expectations. I changed some of the larger things that I don't think I would have, able to stay, would have been able to stay sober had I not changed. I, uh, my first, fourth, and fifth step addressed secrets and, and uh, uh, actions, you know, they were, you know, things that I had done that I felt horrible about that I think I had to get rid of, the, you know, to at least shed enough of the guilt to get about the business of recovery, but not very insightful, not very much insight into the exact nature of my wrongs. It was you know, to be over a period of time with the persistence of the universe trying to teach me what my defective character were and what, <laughs> what, uh, and the universe is very persistent. We will, they don't seem to go away. Most of the problems and issues we have in this room are not new. They aren't days old or weeks old or months old. They're years old, and they're old, and they get real old. You know, they're, um, and, uh, uh, you know, so that's uh, what we're here to discuss, and uh, I will now turn it over to Don. Thanks, Don. <laughs> Thanks, Bob, and good morning, everybody. My name's Don Major, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and I see an awful lot of faces that were here last night, so I'm going to try not to bore you too badly by going over a little bit of the same ground. But, um, but what we decided to do is that Bob and Bill and I will let you folks know enough about us to, to know that we didn't get here because the stuff gave us the hiccups. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and I think that's always good because... The, to me, that's what the whole fellowship is grounded in, is that when we talk with one another, we know that the other person knows what they're talking about. You know, well-intentioned, well-educated, well-informed people that haven't lived through it can tell us over and over and over again, and it just doesn't seem to do any good. But when we look in the eyes of that other alcoholic and we know for an absolute certainty this person has been there, done that, then that's when the magic happens. So. So I'm going to take a few minutes and go over some of the ground that, uh, that went over last night for those of you that were here. Um, 
I was the baby of my family on a tobacco farm down in southwestern Kentucky, and despite the fact that I was convinced up until I got sober that we were in poverty, from which, of course, I rose by my iron will and my sterling intellect to the staggering heights that I reached, the fact is we were middle to upper class, or middle to middle upper class farming people. And I didn't realize that for the first 37 years. I thought we were terribly poor, and, and we had everything we needed and a lot of the things that we wanted. And I was the baby by 13 years. And anything that I say today, please don't construe it as in any way knocking treatment, as in any way knocking counseling, as in any way knocking psychiatry. I believe the big book with all my heart that this world is full of wonderful doctors and wonderful counselors that God has put here for us, and we're absolutely stupid not to use those people. And we need to use those people. What I'm usually talking about is the way that I abused those really great people on the way to getting sober. But I don't have any idea personally what a dysfunctional family is, and the reason for that is that I've never met anybody who claimed that they came from a functional family. Now, until I can identify a functional family, I don't know what a dysfunctional family is, but I'm really pretty sure I was the most dysfunctional thing in my family. And I'm pretty sure my family didn't cause my alcoholism. And um, the brother next to me is 13 years older than I am, and... Uh, by the time I was about seven, I, I had gotten so scared and bored by looking around at the farming people in the community where I grew up. And what I was scared of was that I would grow up to be anything like those decent, responsible, hardworking, mature men. It just terrified me. It was the awfulest looking thing I ever saw. These guys would get up every morning and go right where somebody else told them to do do exactly what they were told to do all day, and then what really blew me away is they would come back to the same people they'd left that morning. And, <coughs> and by the time I was about seven, I had aggravated my older brother until he took me over to the, uh, to the beer joints in the wet county with him, and I'd sit around to drink big oranges and eat pickled eggs while Dan drank beer, and I would observe and listen. And, uh, First thing I noticed was that those honky-tonk heroes had the big flashy cars that they couldn't afford, and I really liked that and proved that for decades by, doing, by imitating that behavior. And we'd walk in, and, and I would, would see them sitting at a bar, and they could do it so cool. I could just look at them and tell that those guys were intelligent, deep, and romantic, and so much more interesting than those old drones out there on the farm. And, and you'd see them sitting over in a booth with their arm draped around a lady that looked a good deal more interesting to me than those gals out there on the farm in their flower sack dresses. And, and these fellows didn't care if they were married to somebody else, and they didn't care if those women were married to somebody else. And I didn't get to finish the first Big Orange before I had overheard enough conversations to find out the real magic. The real magic was that almost every one of those guys was only about that far from being rich and famous. <laughs> every one of those guys had at least one great big deal that was going to pop and they were flat going to be on the map. And I love that because my illness is an illness of big deals. And, and I believe with all my heart that selfishness and self-centeredness are the root of my problems. The way my first sponsor put that is the first thing wrong with me is that disordered ego. And I was never comfortable a single time the first 12 or 13 years of my life. I was always on the run. I couldn't stand looking at what was down inside me. Bob talks about not being able to finish things. I didn't finish anything. And potential, Lord, it looked like I had so much potential. And that created so much agony for me because I believed that. And in a way, I had the potential. But in another way, I realize now I was like a guy that would have been the greatest star that the NBA ever saw if he hadn't have been in that wheelchair. Because I was in a spiritual and emotional wheelchair. And it was phantom potential because I simply didn't have the wellness to do the things that needed to be done to cash in on that. I believe with all my heart that I didn't have any emotional wellness until I got sober at 37. I think what I had was a highly developed ability to mimic emotional wellness. I think I, I learned, before I can even remember, I think I learned to sound like emotional wellness. I learned to put off the very vibrations of emotional wellness, but there wasn't any inside me. Uh, and I was just pursued by that fear that, to me, self-centeredness and fear are, are usually synonyms. They, they mean the same thing. 
and it was just pursued by it, constantly, constantly driven by how I felt. And I, I was sober and 37 years old before it occurred to me for the first time that there might be another way to run one's life other than on the basis of how I felt inside. It never dawned on me that there could be anything in this universe more important than, than how I felt. At 12 or 13, I got drunk the first time, and the magic happened. You hear that from so many of us. Then, of course, I didn't know it was magic. All I knew at the time was on my way to puking, blacking out, passing out, and getting in all that trouble. I passed through a very pleasant place for a few minutes, was what I knew at the time. <laughs> but, but I know now that what happened was that for the first time in my life, when I got enough of that stuff down there, it did something about the pain and the emptiness that that, that, that obsession with myself had created all my life. And I believe that's really, really involved with my powerlessness over alcohol, since I didn't know and wasn't going to know for another quarter of a century that there was anything else in this universe that could do anything about that pain and that emptiness to make me feel good enough inside that I could stand it. It didn't matter what it cost. When the chips got down and the pain got bad enough, it, it simply didn't matter. And I was off and running after that first drunk. Uh, I abused everything and everybody in my life. My parents were older. Uh, school was extremely easy for me, and I always used that as one of my enabling things, and I was always able to, to be glib. Uh, I, I was so proud of myself because when I was a sophomore in high school, my partner and I won the state debate championship, and I had done absolutely no preparation. I, I was would brag about the fact that I prepared the negative case that we won on in the car going to the debate. And that's the way I lived my life, and that's an awfully painful way to live your life. By the time I was 16, my alcoholism and my consumption of alcohol, by the way, from that first drunk until I got sober 25 years later, it doesn't matter how much we drank, it's what it did to us. But just to let you know a little bit about what I was like, I'm confident that I went to bed drunk at least 80% of the night. Uh, nights. Alcohol wasn't something that was periodic in my life. It wasn't a sad show in my life. Alcohol was the center of my life. I knew by the time I was 15 or 16 intellectually that I was an alcoholic. For that reason, I don't think the intellectual knowledge that one is an alcoholic has got much to do with step one of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I thought it was kind of cute. Oh, I was worried about it on one hand, but then on the other hand, it was sort of romantic and exciting, you know. It, after all, I knew about Ernest Hemingway and Alexander the Great and Winston Churchill and Hank Williams and folks like that, and they were obviously my brothers under the skin, you know. It, was, it, it just sort of, so, sort of was a, a, an adjunct of the ocean of creativity and compassion that was inside me, don't you know, and, and the fact that I saw things more clearly than ordinary people, and, and Lord, I, I felt them so much more acutely. And uh, really and truly, <coughs> my mistake was believing that I could live with alcoholism. Oh, I knew it was going to be inconvenient, maybe like having a withered arm or something like that, and, 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 I, and I, knew it, I, I knew that it would shorten my life some, but my God, when you're that age, who wants to live to be 54 years old? It, it, you know, it, it seems infinitely more attractive to live fast, love hard, die young, and leave a beautiful memory. And. Uh, um, so that was my mistake, my belief that I could outsmart alcoholism, that I could outrun alcoholism, that perhaps I could bribe alcoholism. Um, that 25 years was a blur. A lot got accomplished in spite of me. I didn't have any ambition. What I, what I was motivated by was terror. I was motivated by the abject terror that if I didn't get out of that bed and go stick that toothbrush in my mouth and puke, which I did a good half the mornings of my life for 25 years, and go show, up, go show up with approximately the appropriate clothes on at approximately the appropriate place, making approximately the right noise, then you'd see what I was, and I'd have to look at what I was, and I knew I couldn't stand that. So school had been easy for me. I wound up being an early admission student at the University of Louisville, drinking and working my way through undergraduate and law school, and I started practicing law in 1968, practiced for 10 years with a fair degree of material success, personal life, just absolute insanity. I've said, and think I said last night, to the best of my, the best I can reconstruct it, probably a third of the nights in that 10 years, I didn't sleep in a bed. I just sort of passed out someplace else. 
Uh, I couldn't have any human relation that had any reality to it, much less honesty. Honesty was absolutely out of the question. It couldn't have any reality to it. February 1978, I was full of scotch, cocaine, quaalude, speed, vodka, drove a Corvette off the road at 130, did horrible things to my body, lost some bodily functions, had a half dozen major surgeries, was in the hospital for six months out of the following year. Doctors told me I'd probably never walk again without braces on both legs and one or two canes and that my urinary function would probably never be restored. Turned out I've been walking for over 18 and a half years without braces or a cane and about a year after the wreck, surgeons did restore it. That didn't slow me down. My reaction to that was to have my friends bring me in booze and more dope than the doctors were giving me and say intelligent things like, you know, fellas, anybody can quit drinking when the going gets a little tough if they don't have any backbone. But I'm not, but I'm not gonna lighten up on it, so give me a drink and I'll go on. And it was right where I was after that first drunk, I was powerless because I couldn't stand the way I felt inside myself and I didn't know there was anything else to get that. I wound up about a year after that uh, going to my first trip to the asylum, and I use that word because Bill Wilson uses the word, and my mama used that word. It's not meant to be in any way derogatory toward treatment centers or psychiatric hospitals. I was to go to a total of 18 of those deals in two and a half years, and I did. I lost my law license. Uh, my partners kicked me out of the firm. I became alienated and didn't see for over three years my only child, my daughter. Um, I wound up with a new wife during the period right after the wreck. She had to leave me because of my insanity, and she was staying with some friends and died in an accident during that period. The Internal Revenue took my interest in office building and other things like that, and the mortgage companies took the homes that the ex-wives were in, and it was all gone. And for almost a year and a half, I, I lived on the street without an address, and I lived with the conscious the daily conscious conviction that I had to die of alcoholism and drug addiction because, you see, a good half of those places I was in had pre-treatment programs that were based on the 12 steps. And between trips to the asylum, sometimes I went to a lot of meetings because I didn't have anywhere to go. And what would happen during that year and a half is one of you guys would tell me how AA had saved your life and changed your life, and my brain would go, oh yeah, we know it works for you, but Y'all don't understand how really intelligent and special I am. You know, y'all don't understand that my problem is so much more complex than, 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 than I'm able to view it, you know. With your simplistic little minds and your little myth of a higher power, I can see how this works for you guys. But, but, but my God, my intellectual ancestors have created God to keep your intellectual ancestors in line. And, you know, I, I, I can't, you know, it just won't work. And about that, by that time, I'd usually have a tear in my eye, so grateful it would work for you in your simplicity. And, and, and then the very next instance, and one of you guys would tell me how he had saved your life and changed your life, and my brain would go, yeah, I know it works for you, but y'all don't know about the parts of me that I've always been missing. Y'all don't know I've never been able to be consistently responsible about one single thing in my entire life. And besides that, you guys have, uh, y'all don't know I've never been able to love anything or anybody, not even myself. And you guys haven't destroyed everything. You guys have got something to get sober with and something to get sober for. Y'all don't know that I've burned my bridges and I've salted the earth behind me. There's nothing left. There's nothing for me to get sober on. There's nothing for me to get sober for, so it won't work for me because I'm so terrible. The very next heartbeat, it'd be back telling me it wouldn't work for me because I was so magnificent. Of course, I'm believing it both times and going right on. And uh, in uh, April of 1981, I'm was winding up about a 10-day or two-week drunk, which has been my most recent drunk, and loving God started giving me a whole lot of gifts. And I dragged back, not knowing anything was different, into the same clubhouse in Nashville where I'd been to a world of meetings in the six months that I'd lived in Nashville, Tennessee. I had long since drank and drugged my way out of Louisville. And I dragged back into that clubhouse, and I had, I had passed out in AA meetings and been carried out bodily, and they'd caught me shooting dope in the men's room, and they had warned the people they sponsored to stay away from me that I was a loser and I was going to die. And I didn't know a thing was different. If I'd waited until I started feeling like AA would work, if I'd waited until I started believing AA would work, to start blindly doing what you guys in this big book told me to do, I would have been rotting in my grave over 17 years. The great gift that my loving God had given me, and I had no idea I had it, was the first teachability or humility I'd ever had. And what I mean by that is the first willingness to do some things that were suggested about my life 
even though I didn't understand those things, I didn't agree with them, and I didn't think they'd work, and I sure didn't want to do them. But I've, I've been given that gift, and I went back in that clubhouse, and I said, one more time, will y'all tell me? And I had that incomprehensible demoralization that was just my Siamese twin for two and a half years. I didn't think it worked. But by the grace of God, I started blindly doing what I was told, even though I was just intellectually, violently opposed to it. I began to get down on my knees and say words that I didn't mean, that I knew couldn't do any good. But guess what? They worked anyway. And, and they led me through the steps down there. And over the years, my life has been, it, it truly has been a storybook. It absolutely is unbelievable what's happened to me in sobriety. The book talks about being rocketed into a fourth dimension of sobriety and or, of existence. And by the way, they pointed out to me in Nashville in very early sobriety, that book doesn't say that we were able to learn and grasp certain philosophical principles, the knowledge of which rocketed us into a fourth dimension of existence. It says that if we do the things that this book says, then those, by those actions we will be rocketed into a fourth dimension of, of sobriety, of, of existence. And through recovery, through being told that the only program for recovery is these steps, I was told early on that I could go to 10 meetings a week, call myself sponsoring 30 people, talk at conferences all over the country, and work part-time in a treatment center. And if I hadn't done steps one through nine the way this book says in order to reach a state of recovery, or having done that wasn't living a day at a time on 10, 11, and 12 in order to maintain my spiritual condition and get my daily reprieve. Certainly I was in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous on any day I've got a desire to stop drinking, but I wasn't even in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous because the steps of the only program worked that way to me, for me. Over the years, my, my daughter got restored to me uh, when I got back to Louisville less than two years sober. and. She moved in with me two months after we saw one another for the first time, lived with me all through high school, and uh, by God incidents, I talked at the Kentucky State Convention when I was 22 months sober, and people started saying great things to me, like, Don, will you be my sponsor? Will you talk here? And started making some money right away, and uh, it, it's unbelievable what's happened to me. I, I've always tried to go back, uh, no, not until I get in an awful pain, but what awful pain. But one thing that my original sponsor, who was Cherry Carpenter from Nashville, Tennessee, used to tell me periodically. See, I'd get really busy, and I'd get things through my sobriety and Alcoholics Anonymous that either I'd lost or, were, or I'd never had before, or were so nice I'd never dreamt that I would have them. And I'd get having trouble fitting AA into my life. So I'd call Cherry, and, and I wouldn't know. See, I'd get really busy, and I'd get things through my sobriety and Alcoholics Anonymous that either I'd lost or, were, or I'd never had before, or were so nice I'd never dreamt that I would have them. And I'd get having trouble fitting AA into my life. So I'd call Cherry, and, and I wouldn't know what was wrong, and Cherry would say, Don, you've done it again. said, you've got these things back, and you've gotten busy, and you're having trouble fitting AA into your life. He said, it's never going to work that way said, when you got here, no place would take your life, so you were delighted to fit your life in the Alcoholics Anonymous. And he said, if you're going to have it work at all, you're going to have to go back to square one and fit your life in Alcoholics Anonymous. So the last 17 and a half years for me have been a wonderful and sometimes terribly painful process of forgetting that I have to fit my life into AA and being painfully re or remanded and going back and having to do that same thing. And, and I'm going to stop there and pass it on to Bill, and we'll, we'll talk about what happened in early sobriety a little later on. Thank you. Is this one of the promises, things stay up when you need them to, or...? <laughs> I'd like to, uh, what? why do I have a uh, smallest microphone? I have no self-esteem, so uh, during the break, get me the biggest microphone there is in the world. Okay, uh, I'm Bill Pittman, alcoholic. Everything uh, started out okay. I was a live birth, and uh, 
But from that point on, uh, things went downhill. And uh, I grew up in Minneapolis when I was three. And uh, three years old, I had a little puppy. And uh, living in Minneapolis, and our house was being painted. In those days, they would soak their uh, paintbrushes in those coffee cans with gasoline. So the little puppy got and drank all this gasoline out of the paint can and and I watched it run in the backyard and run and run and run in circles and circles and circles and all of a sudden it stopped. Ran out of gas. <laughs> well, uh, When I was, uh, I started drinking when I was 13. I went to school in Heidelberg, Germany. There was no uh, drinking rules then. And uh, drank and used drugs for 19 years, and I just celebrated 19 years without a drink. <laughs> and that brings to mind, uh, I'm gonna ask my sponsor, 19 years using, 19 years without, am I even? Uh, I don't know if that's in the book, but I'll check it out. But, uh, growing up, sobered up when I was 32, I'm 51. With all my drinking, if you were in Minnesota in 66, marijuana came along, Vietnam War, I started using LSD, which caused my hair to grow into a ponytail. <laughs> and I uh, flunked out of the university. I flunked out of a lot of things. I hang around with a lot of AA members who flunk sixth grade. It's a popular grade to flunk for alcoholics. After leaving the university, I went to vocational school, became a carpenter, worked at that very briefly. It's hard to uh, carry sheetrock and pound over your head with a uh, hangover. Until I sobered up for the next uh, nine years, I was in the coin machine business, changing records on jukeboxes, taking the money out of pinballs, 90 bars in the Twin Cities. I owned a bar, uh, also the Yoke Room Bar at Selby and Western in the Old Angus. I still have the tab book in case anyone owes me some money in the audience. <laughs> and I also ran a company of uh, dancers, and I think I married one in Reno. I have a <laughs> tendency of getting married but not following through on the rest of it. <laughs> But as a typical alcoholic, all good things must end either in death or recovery. If you're a real alcoholic, you will stop someday and it's better to be alive when it happens. <laughs> I had tried for three years to sober up by going to AA, by going to outpatient programs, was unable to stay sober because I was unwilling to give up my various jobs. I did have 90 days one time and I, had, I went, got on a plane to go to Cuba to go bass fishing and uh, started to drink on the plane as if I hadn't heard a thing. 78 was uh, a year I don't remember much of, 79 the same. My entry point to the fellowship, and we're all proud of our entry points, happened to be through the Hazleton Foundation. I thought I was going for 28 days, I stayed 10 months. I couldn't read, I had a bad withdrawal, real heavy tolerance. And I also gave up my, all my careers and started over. 
and I've been working in quote unquote the field of alcoholism for the last 18 years. First at Ramsey County Detox, a headquarters in New York, a year in the archives, four years at the grapevine, various aspects of publishing, and now I work for the Hazelton Foundation as their historian. Last weekend I did a four-day seminar on the sixth and seventh step, and now we're doing it again today. I stayed sober for the first three years by not being terrified of going in bars, just hanging around with AAs and not and attending a lot of meetings. I was terrified that I'd have a reverse blackout and re drink. <laughs> I only knew enough of the steps to keep me miserable. In 81, I got, became interested in the history of how the big book was written. Instead of me rewriting it, I became interested in how it was put together. And I've been working on that subject for many years. I've had quite a few, uh, many re-surrenders as I've learned more about the steps. You will hear during the day that I think six and seven are the most important. And it's good to be here. And uh, Don and Bob, and thanks to the committee. When I was at the grapevine, I used to go up and have uh, lunch with Lois Wilson. Bill Wilson had wanted to write a last book called After Sobriety What? He wanted to write a series of articles and a book about how people could be helped in recovery with different issues besides alcohol. So he started to write the uh, different chapters on fear and other topics in the grapevine, then he passed away. I suggested to Lois why don't we put all of his articles together that he wrote over 200, took it to the grapevine board, and now we have a book called Language of the Heart, which I, it's a good book. Bill Wilson, at 23 years sober, wrote what I think is his best article, Emotional Sobriety, how he was still struggling at 23 years with adolescent urges of seeking approval. And for the rest of my time, I'd like to go into a little history pre-Big Book, which uh, the committee and my fellow presenters thought would be a uh, <coughs> way to introduce the rest of the day. Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob, June 10th, 1935, we're the first two AA members, and that's our official day AA started. So now we're 63 years into the program. It's the only fellowship or social movement in America to outlive its founders in the help, helping alcoholics, going back to 1800. Dr. Bob had been attending Oxford group meetings. Bill Wilson attended Oxford group meetings after he sobered up his last time, after receiving the message from Ebby. Then when Bill was in Akron, he brought the message from Dr. Silkworth about alcoholism being an allergy and our craving. And together the program developed over the next three years by more members joining and people attending Oxford group meetings, then they decided to break away from the Oxford group and write the big book and have an organization dedicated exclusively to alcoholics. But in the Oxford group, they had their own big book. It was called 
what is the Oxford group? And they had various principles in the Oxford group that ended up in AA in different forms. Sharing for confession and witness, telling your story, surrender, restitution, guidance, and the four absolutes, honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love. Dr. Bob said he used those four key principles as yardsticks to measure his progress in, in recovery. So many of the principles that ended up in AA came from the Oxford group, ended up in the big book. Over the years, various people have put one of the principles of AA along the steps because in our 12th step, practice these principles. The principles aren't the steps. Here's one famous list, and I'll read it to you. Step one is honesty. Step two is hope. Step three is faith. Step four is courage. Step five is integrity. Step six is willingness. Step seven is humility. Step eight is brotherly love. Step nine is justice. Step 10, perseverance. Step 11, spiritual awareness. Step 12 is service. I'll be saying this during the day, but I think the principles of the program are the opposite of our character defects. And step six and seven, when we do work them and look at them, we try to get the balance between our character defects and the principles. I will tell different stories about how my char character defects are alive and well and how I handle them today. And, uh, Hank Parkhurst, the second AA member in New York, came up with a 13-page outline for the big book. They communicated with Dr. Bob in Akron, Ohio, that they should write their own book. They assigned Bill Wilson to be the primary author. People can come up and look at these objects later, but Lois Wilson gave me eight pages of Bill's first draft of the doctor's opinion handwritten. Ruth Hawk would then type up the handwriting, send it to Akron for their comments. Then it would go back to New York for more comments. So the brilliance in the big book is that it's a we book. Many opinions. It's just not Bill Wilson's ideas. It's quite a few people's ideas going back and forth. They needed money to print the big book, so they sold stock. Here's, this cop, here's an original stock certificate. The first company of AA was called Works Publishing after Faith Without Works is Dead. $25 a share. They had, you have to pay the printer before you can have a book printed or receive them. So they got the money together by selling stock to get the big book printed. Here's a, here is the original big book, came out in March 1939. It's the only one with a red cover. They told the printer to use thick paper. When the book came back to the office and they opened the case, they said, boy, is that a big book. <laughs> So that's the significance of the term, although <laughs> it's changed, uh, there's different ideas about that now. Here's the original dust jacket, they were going to take it to bookstores to sell, so there's a lot of uh, endorsements on it, which we don't put on anymore. Also on the first printing it said, uh, send 350. We'll send it C and we'll send it COD. You can examine it for seven days, and if not satisfied that the book will be helpful, return the money. We'll return it and give you money back. We don't do that anymore either. So. <laughs> so 
Between 1939, when they printed the book, and 1941, the sales were very dismal until the Saturday Evening Post article came out and they received 6,000 letters about where people around the country could go to AA meetings. There was no AA meeting in 1941 in Minnesota. There was no AA member. A gentleman from uh, Minneapolis, Pat Cronin, wrote to New York, said, where can I join AA in Minneapolis? His letter was forwarded to Earl Treat in Chicago. His story is in the big book, The Man Who Sold Himself Short. Earl handed the letter off to some businessmen who were coming to Minneapolis to meet various people who had inquired about AA and they helped sober up Pat Cronin and started AA in Minnesota in 1941. 40. 40. We have other... So that's how AA spread around the country. And there's only two paragraphs in this book and in the current third edition on the sixth and seventh step which make them look like they're not very important at first reading. But maybe the whole book is about step six and seven. And I think we'll get into that today. Thank you. I will take a 15 minute break. Hi everybody, I'm still Don Major and still an alcoholic. <laughs> Can we start this session with the serenity prayer please? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. All right, well, in, in this, uh, this session, what we sort of roughly plan to do is talk a little bit about problems that we've had in sobriety. I know it'll come to a great shock to you that we've had a few of those, but uh, we're, we're going to talk about problems in sobriety, and, and in my case, I'm going to talk particularly about those problems that I didn't seem to be able to get any help on whatsoever until something really important connected with six and seven um, happened to me. So, so that's what I'm going to try to do. And, and uh, I was kind of machine gunning facts at you earlier. I apologize for that. And and somebody mentioned to me something that I do want to mention for new people. Um, it's something that I forget. I guess because it's my story, and and I kind of hear a part of it every time I regurgitate it. And, and, and what was mentioned to me is, is the fact that there's a little danger in my story because it's, it's really kind of a low-bottom story, you know, the wreck and losing everything and living on the street and, and that sort of thing. And, and what was mentioned to me is you don't have to go that far. And it can be a little dangerous, I think, because I have no idea what the percentages would be, but I've got a real strong suspicion that most people who are so hard-headed and so driven by self-will that they ride the thing down that far die. It was just by the grace of God that I'm one of the small percentage that was able to live. So if you're new and young in the program, uh, Please don't think that you can ride it down as far as I did and say, gee, I'm drinking drug another 10 years and not getting nearly as bad as that guy, and, 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 and then I can get sober. But, but the problem... I don't think they want the brain damage. <laughs> that sometimes the brain damage is actually pleasant, Bob. <laughs> But at any rate, uh, I, want, I, I wanted to mention that. Another thing, for those of you that were here last night, I was kind of compressing things, and I left something out. I told you that the second most important thing in my sobriety was that, um, that getting on my knees every morning and every night, and I never told you what the first most important thing in my sobriety is. And, 
And this is just a gift. Um, I didn't set out to say, I'm going to make this the first most important thing in my sobriety, but the pure gift is that every day of my sobriety, including today, the single most important thing is that I'm not going to drink or take dope today, just for today, with God's help and yours, even if my butt falls off. Because, you see, none of the rest of it works without that. And I had a really hard time getting the difference between powerless over alcohol and powerless over my elbow dam. I kept thinking that it was your responsibility and God's responsibility to keep me from drinking and taking dope. And I couldn't get sober until I understood, understood that's ultimately my responsibility. Now, you folks and God gave me an awful lot of help. And the good news for you new folks is that after about 60 days, I haven't wanted to drink or take dope a single day in all these years. Now, have I thought about it? Sure. I don't think the memory of it will ever be erased. But as far as wanting to do it, I haven't wanted to do it. I haven't felt the edge of that compulsion. So that's the first most important thing. Well, I brought you up to the fact where I'd gotten sober and I had gone back to Louisville with my tail between my legs because I couldn't get a minimum wage job in Nashville. If I could have gotten a minimum wage job in Nashville, no way would I ever have gone back to Louisville because writing those people that I owed all that money and had done all those things to those little letters from my attic that I was living in and including, I, I wrote people in institutions that I owed about $150,000 of men's letters. There were seven of them that I wrote. And my net worth, of, no, my net worth was very negative. My total assets were 14 $1 bills. And I had included a dollar bill in each of those seven letters, and that was great. That was what I was supposed to do. But that was still a whole different animal from going back to Louisville and meeting those people face to face and interacting with them. I didn't want to go, but I did. And like so many things, even though I didn't feel like doing it, I didn't think it was going to work out, I got back up there, and my law license had been put back in order at about a year and a half sober as a pure byproduct of steps eight and nine. And the bar association that I had so disgraced uh, embraced me at first very reluctantly and then tentatively and ultimately it turns out that, you know, we in AA are not the only ones with capacity for forgiveness and we're not the only good people in the world. We're not the only spiritual people in the world. We have just borrowed a little piece of it from millions of others that have had it for thousands of years. And those wonderful people accepted me. And, and I got back to Louisville, and, and I've always gone to a lot of meetings, and I've always been kind of involved in sobriety, and been real involved, in fact. So neat things started happening. Uh, the first, year, first month I was back in Louisville, I made more money than I had made in the previous four years. Now, that wasn't much money, but I made more in that one month. And the first thing you know, I'm driving new cars, and, I, and I'm wearing nice clothes again. And I mentioned that by God incidents, when I was a little less than two years sober, I'd talk at the Kentucky State Convention, and people started saying all these great things to me. They started saying, gee, Don, will you talk here? Will you be my sponsor? Will you do this? And I had been told by my sponsor that I was supposed to say yes to those things, so I started saying yes. My daughter that I had been estranged from uh, moved in with me and lived with me all through high school, and all that was great. And all these things were going wonderful. And I don't want to give you the impression that the first nine years of my sobriety weren't wonderful. They were absolutely wonderful. But during that nine years, some character defects, and particularly those that had to do with relationships with the opposite sex and financial chaos, like to have beat me to death. And during that nine years, I, I can't tell you how hard I worked on relationships with the opposite sex and financial chaos. Lord, I bet 90% of my energy went to working on relationships with the opposite sex and financial chaos. And I used good tools, and I used every tool I knew to use. I used rigorous honesty. You know, rigorous honesty, if you are a little bit nutty anyway, can get real sticky in a boy-girl relationship. <laughs> it, it, it really, really can. I, I used the steps. I used prayer. I used sponsors. I used meetings. I used outside counseling when it seemed appropriate. And, and every week for nine years, relationships with object sex and financial chaos got worse. 
over the period of those years, I'm, I'm uh, uh, talking at more and more places and traveling more and more talking, more and more people are asking me to sponsor them. So I'm sponsoring a whole room full of guys, and I'm, I'm talking around, and people are kind of throwing gardenias at me and saying, oh, boy, Don, you really got this AA program. And I did have it enough to live, obviously, and I did have it enough to function, but I didn't have it enough to keep from just being absolutely dying inside. Let me just give you some ideas of the things that were going on with me. Um, in <coughs> extremely early sobriety, now they say that you stop growing emotionally when you start drinking alcoholically. And I don't know whether that's true or not, but it, it seems like it would work pretty well with me because when I got sober at 37 in April of 1981, I was about 12 or 13 emotionally. So what happened when I got me some false teeth and I began to lose the bloat and that sort of thing and, and ladies began not to run the other way quite so quickly when they saw me uh, and, and some of them began to think, you know, this little fellow might actually live. You know, there might, might, might be, be something here. I started to have some interaction with, with the opposite sex and I didn't know what in the world I was doing. What would happen, somebody would show me some attention and I would just fall absolutely, totally and helplessly in love. And, you know, I would make all of these sincere commitments and mean every word of it about how we were going to live our lives together and all these wonderful things. And then somewhere between two and six weeks seemed to be the time period. I would wake up and it would just hit me and it wouldn't be a thought. It would be absolutely something that took over my entire being that if I didn't get away from her, I was going to die. <laughs> and when, when, you're, when you're sort of an incipient spiritual guru to these people, people, that's really embarrassing. You know, every two to six weeks you're having one of these deals where you're running somebody away, and they were usually in the program. Well, at, <coughs> at a little less than three years sober, it got so bad that I went down to Nashville to see Cherry, my, my old sponsor in Nashville. And Cherry later told me that he didn't tell me any of those, to quote him, damn fool things that I thought he told me. But... But what I came away from there with was that even though I'd had all these relationships and, and abused several churches and marriages and that sort of thing, that I had never made God a party to my relationship. And also, I had not been following God's rules because I had been having sex with these women before I married them. So I went back to Louisville and I made a list of the perfect woman because having done my fourth and fifth step I had formed a picture of what a spiritual dawn would look like and I knew that it was my obligation not only my right but my obligation to go to work with God's help I didn't know that to go to work on my character defects in order to make me into what I had decided a spiritual dawn ought to be so I made a list of those attributes that the ideal companion to a spiritual dawn would have and, and, and I made that list and I made it prayerfully and, and I made it with talk, with conversation with the folks that I trusted and about five days after I made the list I had also started praying for God to send me a wife because in this picture of a spiritual dawn we needed a wife. Well by this time I'm 40 years old and all four or five days after I made the list sure enough the ideal lady had the misfortune to come tripping back. <laughs> well. Three weeks later, without ever having sex, and absolutely convinced that I was riding the crest of God's will, we married. <laughs> the same thing happened in somewhere between two and six weeks, but I couldn't admit it. I mean, no way. So I made it 14 months, and I had to tell her I, that I'm sorry. I've just made a terrible, terrible mistake. And she was and is in, in the program, and she and I are friends today, and, and we both refer to, to that interlude when, when we give a lead. And, and it worked out okay, but it was really agony at the time. Uh, I went on a little further. In the meantime, I had an awful lot of trouble. I've always been a criminal defense lawyer, and things keep ha kept happening to the cash fees between the time I got them and the time I got them in the bank. It, it just seemed like I had terrible trouble getting all that cash in the bank. And in and, and meantime, even though I've gone to making money again, the debt's building up, I've still got the debt from 
from from the old days, and I'm paying on all that old debt every month. And I felt well when I was three and a half years sober, my sponsor and my lawyer and I got together and decided that my financial condition had improved to the point where I could file bankruptcy without getting indicted. And that's the literal truth. October of 1984, three and a half years sober, the decision was made that things had improved to the point where I could file bankruptcy. I filed a Chapter 11, and it was such a mess that there were five years of litigation before the plan was even approved for me to start paying. Beheim uh, <coughs> on the boy-girl scene. <coughs> I had decided... In the summer of 1987, I'd had a particularly embarrassing round of these relationships not working out the way it seemed like they were going to the first 24 hours. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and since I had such financial chaos, I, I thought a new Porsche would probably make me feel better and help solve that. So, so I went and got a, a friend of mine in the program who had credit to let me lease a Porsche in his name. And, so I had, had this new Porsche, and, and I took it to a car wash with the temporary uh, tag still on it, and this uh, delightful little Asian lady who was some little bit younger than I, about 16 years, was, was working in the office of the car wash, and, and she liked the Porsche. And, uh, and, and, and uh, to, in, in order to understand this, to put it in focus, about Five months before that, I had finally had the epiphany. I had finally seen the light. The answer was celibacy. So I had gone celibate about five months before that. And uh, that was a mess because my celibacy was sort of, you know, celibacy, and my definition really was kind of similar to Clinton's, I think. You know, <laughs> conversations going on with these ladies, and I had these friendships that were very touchy-feely and that sort of thing, but, but I wasn't having sex, and I was sober, and, uh, and, and I felt very good about that, uh, and so, <coughs> so she liked the portion, we wound up, uh, we, we wound up, um, um, having lunch and then a couple of weeks later she came home with me still hadn't had sex and she didn't leave and i got so crazy that the only way i could figure out to get her to leave was marry her so i could divorce her and and that, seriously that 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 was my thought process in that. and uh by that time i was what uh six years sober and uh so i married her and we had a a five month uh marriage and a 22 month divorce and uh the, there is um uh, the, there is a, a a son from that marriage so i've had the privilege of making the equivalent of a ferrari lease payment for the last 10 years on uh, on account of that so that's the way that was going the finances were just going worse and worse and worse the chaos and see through all this, I didn't have any bad goals. What I sincerely wanted was a stable, monogamous relationship with a reasonably spiritual, decent lady so that she and I could be reasonably comfortable and go about our business. All these things that I'm telling you were happening, that wasn't what I was looking at. That wasn't what I was trying to do. I was trying so hard to get it fixed I was trying so hard to make it work that way. And on the financial chaos, I didn't want wealth. 